Amen. Australia needs uh, uh, for God to show up and, and, and intervene uh, in our nation, especially with the recent stuff that's happened in our nation. So let's keep praying. Let's get together and uh, with all the churches. And it's, it's, we're seeing this is uh, from all over. It's Assemblies of God. It's mainline churches, the Catholic, the Anglicans, uh, all coming together. To, to, to pray over common issues that we're believing God. How wonderful it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like the oil that begins to flow. And when they are together in one accord, I believe there's power in the unity, in prayer. We're going to shift them to some things in the nation. Amen. Hallelujah. So this morning, I'm blessed. We are blessed as a church to have this mighty man of God in our midst, uh, Dr. Wayne Gwilliam. I've known him for quite a few years. I can't remember how we actually met. I believe it might have come up to Toowoomba. I was trying to remember how we met. Um, yes, they came up to Toowoomba to bring a tent uh, with the Tabernas, I believe, one time years ago. And um, when they came up to bring that a tent to do a big crusade in Toowoomba, uh, they uh, advertised it and got it out to all the churches in town and and uh, and nobody really wanted to support the tent uh, during that time. And uh, Victory Life Toomba, uh, we came around them, not just financially, but we, we closed our uh, night services and our meetings. And we said, let's go and uh, support the tent. And uh, and we came, uh, we, we, I believe it was over at uh, Showgrounds. And, and uh, got to meet this mighty man and got to know him over the years. And let me tell you, I have been blessed by the faith that he carries. He carries a tremendous. Uh, apostolic grace, uh, teaching grace over his life, really evangelistic in nature, and uh, been preaching the gospel around the world uh, with Dr. Rodney L. Brown and different other ministries over the years. So a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of revelation and experience that God has given him. Join me, and let's just welcome this mighty man, Dr. Wayne Gwilliam. And if I can have somebody help me just get this uh, pulpit down here. Uh, maybe one of you guys come and help us out. He's tall enough, amen. He doesn't need to be up here. <laughs> if I preach from down there and look uh, uh, just right over here. <laughs> the, the other way. <laughs> amen, amen. Oh, I got to get a mic. Yep, I'll get, get it to you here. Here we go, Mike. Thank yeah. you very much. Bless you. Yes. Isn't God good? Jimmy was very polite in how we met. He actually <laughs> saved my rear end. <laughs> Became a friend for life. Amen? Amen. God's good. Yes. All the time? Yes. Not some of the time. Yes. Amen? Yes. You love Jesus? Yes. How do you know? The Bible says this is how we know that we obey His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Pretty powerful. Amen? Love is a commandment, not an emotion. It produces an emotion of freedom, security. It develops an ambience around us that we can grow. Doesn't take captive, doesn't think evil thoughts releases it, spurs the person on to higher dimensions. And so that's why we know that God is a God of love. Every person that I've ever met in my life, when I got down to the bottom, even for hours and hours and hours of counseling, is to bring them to the honest truth, and the truth will set them free. That all their life, they've been chasing love. But they've been looking in the wrong places. God is love. Every man is looking for God. But he's had a wrong misinterpretation. He's been presented in a wrong light. Because if that light was the light that would lead people to it, we'd all have God. Because we're all looking for love. We're all looking for that place where we can begin and flow. Love has many faces. Love wounds. I don't think there's ever a person that's had a deep hurt within their lives that I've met and had to try and 
somehow bring to some type of healing that's perpetual, that keeps breaking out within their life. And it's always being accredited to love. They try to love. And love wounded. Love never wounds. Toxic love wounds. But God's love heals. It's the only thing that heals. But we have to get an understanding of love. I remember doing a situation where, or I was in a situation, I said not doing a situation, but in a situation in a Bible school, and there was a heap of hungry academic people. They'll eat anything that was a theory, a philosophy, anything that they could get their mind around, sidetrack them, anything that would cause their head to be a little bit expounded like heroin addicts. They just had to get another shot, you know, something new. And I thought, how do I really get to them and how do I get around them and open their door? So I asked them, I, several people I just asked, I said, can you tell me what is the main structure of love? And do you know that I asked about 10 people and about 10 of them, not nine, 10, all put it down to an emotional experience. Basically, centered around relationship or marital or sex. But if that's love, then God never loved anybody. Jesus never loved anyone. And yet that is the source of love and the love that wounds when we build on a fragment of love. We understand that the Greeks had four words for it, agape, story, toge, euros, and philio. And that Euros is a sexual type of a love. When you build on a truth and try and make it the truth, you've got a heresy. You've got poison. I'm going to say that again. When you take a truth and make it the truth, you build a heresy or a poison into the people. The truth will set them free, not a truth. A truth will give them a shaft of light and a little bit of a, a band-aid experience. But it takes many truths to make the truth. And we've seen the restoration of truth that as the church has lost it in the restoring, and we call the restoration of truth revivals. And that's what they are. They're a revival of something that was once alive and now is dead or awfully wounded. And uh, it's not evangelism. It's not what we call winning the lost. You would have to have the whole world saved to have a revival to bring everybody in the church. Revival is ministering to the saved. Evangelism is ministering to the lost. They don't know him. You're not there to convict them because they can't be convicted. Number one, they don't know Jesus. That would lead them to religion if you got them to join their church because... You need the Holy Spirit to convict, and you need to be saved to get the Holy Spirit. It has to begin with conception. A man can't take a piece of sperm and put it on a table and try to dress it and correct it. It has all the potential of life once it has conceived, once it has come to birth and start to grow. You're not there to give it direction. You're not there to prophesy over it. You're there to give it life. You know that we were once a microscopic piece of seed. You had to really search for it. But yet so much of that was in that. You were every part of you, your hair, your eyes, your intellect, everything was there in you waiting to be released, a seed microscopically. And there wasn't a particular person a pilot seed that was waiting inside the womb, that when you came into the womb, you got to go up here, turn left, and you'll see an ovary down there, and you've got to enter this way if you're a man, you've got to enter that way if you're a woman. Everything was programmed into that seed. That seed knew exactly what it had to do once it was released, whether it was in consent of the woman or not. She could have been raped. Once that seed was there, it was heading, and it was heading for a particular place that it had been predestined to head for. So was the incorruptible seed of Christ. 
when we go out to bring a knowledge of Jesus to somebody, we're just going out there to make them aware. We're living in a, a world today that, and not like the world that I grew up in. When I grew up, even though I was as bad as you could possibly get, I had a foundation that I knew where home was. There was enough Christianity put in us that we still had a belief in God. This world doesn't have a belief. This world doesn't even have a belief in families. They've probably had five moms and ten dads in their journey. Everything that we had has been stolen to some degree, and it's got to get back to education, back to the simplicity. And the thing that will bring that education is the uncorruptible seed of Christ, and it's a simple thing that Jesus has asked us to do. And that is to go into all the world and announce that he is the victor. To introduce people to him. After 45 years in ministry around the world, there's two things I'm absolutely sure of. The first one is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is absolutely the Redeemer of humanity. He's the beginning and the end of our faith. He is the author of our faith. And I, the second is, I'm not him, and neither are you. You don't have to do what he does. All you have to do is introduce him. He then does the rest. Absolute pride within inside of us tells us we have to do it, and that we override him. Stand back, old fellow, we'll do it for you. Rather than to release people to the seed and let the seed do the work. Let the seed grow when it comes into a person's mind. It's heading straight for the spiritual man, the same as that piece of sperm was heading straight for that ovary. It's programmed to get in there, and a conscience is birthed. A new voice starts to rise up and starts to speak to people, and louder and louder it gets day by day until it starts leading them and directing them. And that's when God can add to the church daily them that are required because they've now got life. They've now been born and now they've got to be fathered and mothered. And he will lead them there. And he's a good, good father. People say to me, when we lead people to the Lord on the streets, who's going to shepherd them? Well, tell me who shepherded them on Pentecost when they only had 120 people, never had a building, never had a deacon, they didn't know who they were. They just was bewildered. They were just finding out the Holy Spirit and who he looked like and what he represented. And they were getting introduced to a spiritual world. And God says, okay. And Peter went down and preached in the first day. 3,000 came in. They were really struggling. Well, let's sit down and how do, who's going to shepherd them? <laughs> That's where the power struggles begin. And to top it off, just a few weeks later, he gave another 5,000. And then, just to top it off, he went from adding to multiplying. Now, he can speak to a billion people at once. But we can't get our mind there if we're carnal and we're a control freak. I'm going to say that again. If we're carnal and we're a control freak. Can you imagine if the doctor didn't want to give you your baby? I like this one. I'm taking it home. I don't trust you. <laughs> I tell you what, there'd be a few doctors around with a few bloody eyes and no, <laughs> broken jaws. <laughs> anyway, we've been in the area for uh, 10 days. Some of our team is staying for another four days, and we've had. Uh, 1,410 people on the streets commit their lives to Christ, invite him in. What that looks like is not what a lot of people think it looks like. To do that, we've had to talk to about uh, at least 15 to 20,000 people. And people think that we've got this humongous team that goes and does that. I'm just going to ask the team to stand up. Can you guys at the back just stand up? This is the ones that have been out in the highways and the byways of this area. (laughs) 
These are the ones that have just got 1,410 people to confess and to invite Christ into their lives. Sit down. And this young lady, she's going to bring her out to say hi. I'd like to call her like a daughter. But she's not like a daughter because you can, you can have a, a wife, you can have a husband and still not have a friend. You can have a brother and a sister and still not have a friend. You can have a mum and a dad and still not have a friend, son or daughter. This young lady has become a friend. I don't have a lot of friends, but the friends I do have I cherish very much. As God has touched her life and... Uh, you know, I've gone through some pretty hard times, and I only have two real strong friends in my life. Both of them are women. One is my wife, and the other is Anna. I listen to them pretty much intently because they ride over me, make sure I'm trying to do the right thing, eat the right thing, go to the right places, and hold to that which I believe. And uh, so do my men friends. But, I, you know, they've uh, got churches and places and ministries and people that are there, you have a lot of acquaintances, but very few friends. If you can count your friends on your two hands, you've got a lot of friends. Amen. So I'd like to just come, and this is the young lady. She'll just introduce herself and tell her just what they do and how they talk to someone about Jesus before we go on. Her name's Anna for now. Come on, Anna. It's not Anna for tomorrow, but it's Anna for now. Okay, um, well, just to, oh, I'll just start. Well, my name is Anna, nice to meet you guys. Um, it's been about 10 years now since, since the day I gave my heart to the Lord. And uh, my father was a pastor, but just like, just because he was a pastor didn't mean that I was. I sat in church, it was just religious to me. Every day was just the same, it was nothing different. I couldn't feel anything different. Um, and so, it's okay. This is a bit graphic, but it's almost like going into a room with a naked woman. It's just looking at her, but then there's a difference in intimate, like going intimately with her and just sitting there looking at her. I was just sitting there looking. I'm just sitting here looking in the pastor, just looking at my dad preaching, but nothing that he was doing really was getting to me. But I knew that something was out there. Um, it, w it wouldn't be until the day that my dad died. Correction. It wouldn't be until the day he went to be with the Lord that I went searching. I was already searching by then, but I just went and searched and see if this Christ man that he was preaching was real. And uh, it wouldn't be until I met him face to face that it really did change my life. And, um, and that's the testimony that I give everybody out there that, that pretty much gives the heart to the Lord that our team does that you, to go out there and so, um, yeah. And so uh, just to recap and how I met him, uh, I was sitting in church, and um, I'm just sort of sitting there, worship is going on, and I hear a voice telling me, raise your hands to me. And I'm sitting there going, oh, oh, oh my God, next week, I promise, next week, next week. And I'm sitting there, not realizing that he just talked to me. I'm sitting there going, oh, I promise, next week, because my whole family, we all just tease a bit market, but like, oh, 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 just laugh about it and joke about it whatnot. And it wouldn't be until next week happened, same time, same place, worship happened. Got a glimpse of what happened last week, and then he just started speaking to me again, raise your hands to me. Wouldn't be until I'm sitting there going because thinking that my siblings that like sitting right next to me were going to call me religious or whatever because that's what we did. Uh, I ended up, I ended up uh, bit by bit just slowly raising my hands and he's like higher and I'm like oh, hesitating higher. I'm like oh, oh. And then it wouldn't be until he stopped talking three times. I knew I had to do it. Raised my hands and for the first time in my life I felt freedom. Since then, Dr. Wayne preaches in his teachings and in sermons that the day that he, that he introduces himself to you, you find out who you are. I actually believe he did. It wouldn't be long before he took me out on the streets and uh, I ended up just having to tell each single one of them, oh, hey, Jesus loves you, but fear of man and me, I'm like talking to the back of their heads while they're gone, like way gone. And he was like, Anna, do it properly. Uh, like, it wouldn't be until I actually really did it with all my heart, but then it wouldn't be until, oh, there was one evening I came back home and doing it the whole day and coming back and ending my day getting dropped off at my bus stop. I ended up heading out, and all I hear him say, say Jesus loves you to the bus driver. And I'm like, oh, <sighs> okay. Just hoping he would change his mind by the time I got to the front to get off the bus. But it didn't. I ended up going in, and I looked at him and say, hey, I just want to let you know that Jesus loves you. The guy, the way that the guy looked at me, it was as if, like, he ended up saying, as if to say, 
uh, just, it's just the look on his face. He said, thank you. I really needed to hear that. Just the look on that man's face. I was like, oh, wow. Oh, okay. And so I ended up doing it properly the next day and doing it properly with all my heart. I, everything just started flowing by then. It just started rolling um, from Jesus loves you to this whole sentence. To just not only that, but just to not even saying anything at all. Um, when I met Dr. Wayne three years ago, he was teaching on, uh, on how to take evangelism in, in another direction. And I was waiting for that, for another direction. I just said, I know what. Um, from just praying to people, all I, hear, all, all I could hear God say was, Anash, shut your mouth. I'm like, okay, because you're, you're so used to just talking, but sometimes it just doesn't want you to talk. I, just, I didn't get that. So he ended up preaching and was sharing teaching, actual teaching and how to just release the anointing. And then since then, I, I've been able to see things just happen, just watching him do it, not using my mouth, but just with a touch of a hand, you just release that anointing, and all of a sudden, you just see each one get ministered differently. And uh, since then, uh, but then just even, but just even as I Tim go out, each one of them notice something different that is changing. Every single day, every single day they push through. And this isn't like a daily, like one, two hours. The guy that leads it, like the guy that takes a man leads that, takes them out the whole day. Every single one of them do that. And I want to say this little prayer with you. It's a short prayer. Just say this prayer with me. Everyone from the sound of my voice. Say, Lord Jesus, I don't know who you are, but I ask that if you really did, die for me, although I don't understand it, with what faith I have, I want to say thank you. And I open up my heart, and I receive you as my Lord and my Savior in Jesus' name. Now, that's an honest prayer, right? And that's the same prayer that we get everyone out there to say that same prayer to. And so it is anything, God, we just say that prayer. We sow that seed, and we leave. That's, that's the simplicity of it. That's all you got to do. But, um, yeah, and so... Let's give her a hand. It's not our power of the intellect that gets people saved. It's not on our vocabulary. It's on our integrity of heart that gets people saved. And the key of it is never underestimate the power of a seed. Once that seed comes in, and once it gets into fertile ground, there's a party. There's a race going on. And life is going to be the birth of it. And that's how you start to seed cities. And that's what we do. We go in and we see the city. We just don't, we don't, it's not here to preach on pulpits or do anything. We occasionally preach, like by my friend Jimmy. And uh, we just did for something for um, Pastor Gary. But the key of it is, is we just come to seed cities and do that as purity as we can we can't take up offerings on the street we can't get them saved and uh, say look that'll cost you 20 bucks <laughs> this is not a time of taking money and the amazing thing is God always pays for it he always pays for it up front as we go out and we do it and uh, you know it's just a wonderful wonderful experience to see people break down to see people Thank you, because you're not preaching at them. You're not trying to convict them of their sin. You're trying to introduce them to a Savior. And I remember when I really got set free from that. Because, you know, you can really struggle with identity. You know, you think you've got to be a little Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is a God of diversity. Look at the trees that he made. There's, they're all different. So many different species, so many different species of flowers. Such a diverse God, but so unifying as he brings it together to create a glorious presentation. He made you just the way you are, your personality. He likes you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He made me just the way I am. And sooner or later, you get to accept yourself. You're not looking to change your nose, your eyes, your ears, your boobs, or whatever, your buttocks. You're willing to accept yourself. When you look in the mirror, you like what's looking back at you, and you're not critical. If you're critical at what's looking back at you in the mirror, God help your friends. 
Because you've got to love one another as you love yourself. If, you, if you're down on yourself, you're going to eat your friends. <laughs> Getting into that place where God brings that acceptance. Amen? Getting into that place where God sets you free. I remember that when I was in Assemblies of God pastor, and we had a bit of a breakthrough uh, in a place called Orange. It was a good breakthrough for that time. And uh, we had the fastest growing rural church in Australia at that time. Again, we built a team, and again, we saw God do great things. You can't build it on one man, two men. It's a team. One pe person can bring 100 people into your church. One person can take 100 out. But if everyone wins one and they weave it in like a web, you can't break that thing. It's the bulletproof. And um, that's what we learn to do, and that's what we teach people to do. And do you feel that you're the pastor and everything rests on you when you're really there to just shepherd the sheep and bring out the best of them? You're not there to compete with them, but you're there to complete them. And if you bring that spirit of competition in, then there will be a spirit of competition in everybody's life. Marriages and everything will start to suffer. Business will start to suffer. School work will start to suffer because instead of a spirit of completeness, that's a period of contentment. Godliness of contentment is great gain. Then you'll have a competition, and in that will be wars and strife and divisions, fractures like you've never seen. We get what we sow for, amen? And I was searching, and uh, in those days we used to have, you know, gospel books out. We didn't have uh, CDs even then. We had tapes and uh, we had little books and things like that, and there used to be a guy called Kenneth e. Hagen, and uh, someone gave me his books, and I started reading them. But I soon found out they were Christian pornography. You had to hide them under your pillow, <laughs> under, under your mattress, because if the religious found out, you were classified as one of them. And yet there was something in it that touched your spirit and fed your spirit. There was something in it that stimulated you. Anyway, I was in... Uh, America, and I was going to uh, meet with a man called David Wilkerson in uh, Dallas. When I got into Dallas, and I had a young intern with me, and uh, we got to the place where we were supposed to meet David Wilkerson, and he had left a message for me that he had moved to New York. And uh, we couldn't change our plane tickets and that, so we had a couple of weeks in between b before we could go to New York, because we were booked to go to New York. I had to do uh, some meetings there with... Uh, the Schembach family. And uh, I didn't know what to do. So we decided to hire a car and drive to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and have a look at R. Roberts University. Before we went there, we went to Louisiana and had a look at what Jimmy Swaggart had built. And the young intern asked me, what are we doing here? And I said, I just got to get it in my head that this guy that came from the bayou He's made of flesh and blood, the same as we are. And if he can do this, then we can do it. You've got to see something, and you've got to get it in your spirit that's not impossible. When they were trying to run the four-minute mile, they were exercising and exercising and exercising. No one could run it because no one was fit enough. And that's the truth. But it wasn't physical fitness. It wasn't to one trainer realize it wasn't in the physical fitness of the individual it was in the mindset. And as he started to convince the mindset and started to train and show, you know, just expand it and start just moving the line, he made it instead of a mile, it was a half a mile, and the guy did it. But he didn't do it. But every time he moved it until he, he got it and he genuinely run the, the, the four-minute mile. After he run it, they started coming through everywhere. Everyone started to run it because it was now possible. It had moved from impossible to possible. And that's the key, isn't it? If you can remove from your mind, it's hard to lead someone to the Lord, but it's a beautiful invitation to life that you're going to give them something that money can't buy, the most precious thing to them. And it's the joy. It's a celebration. It's not a screaming match. It's not a, a putting down match. It's there to bring them the greatest gift of life. 
and you're excited that you've got it to give it to them. Amen? And they've got to see it in you. Can you imagine when our team go out and make them dress properly? Because you don't want somebody coming up and saying, excuse me, you met Jesus? I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. And they look at you and think, mate, if he's, that's what he did to you, I don't want him. <laughs> you want them straight away to have a look and see something that's intriguing. A temperament that's intriguing. Somebody that's there out of sincerity, not out of ambition, not out of dominance, but there to give them a message. And uh, we, believe it or not, don't have too many people chase us down the streets. But most people are very open. Most thank you for doing it. And... Um, when I went into Kenneth e. Hagen's office, and it was a long story how we got there, but we got there. It was absolutely miraculous because he didn't see people. It was his in uh, Winter Bible School, locks himself away even from his own family, and God opened the door. And he was quite a, a, a harsh man to talk to, straight to the point. What do you want me for? I said, well, I, I read your books, and I'd like to meet, m meet you <laughs> and talk about faith. He said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make an appointment for you. You can talk to uh, 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 Fred Price. You like Fred Price? Go to Fred Price. Fred Price died two days ago. It's a shame, but his son will take it on. He surely left us a legacy. I had to stop reading his books. I tried to walk on water and nearly drowned. <laughs> I found out it was presumption. <laughs> he wrote a good book if you want to get it called Faith, Foolishness, or Presumption. <laughs> it was like looking into the mirror of my life. <laughs> Sorted me out real quick. Anyway, <laughs> as I was sitting in Kenneth E. Hagen's office, and he got, he said, uh, I sent you to Fred Price. And I looked and I said, I didn't come halfway around the world to talk to the chopping block. I come to talk to the butcher. I had never said that before in my life. <laughs> and I thought, this is when you wish your mouth was a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Suck that one back. <laughs> but he burst out laughing. That was the type of man he was. He just, and he gave a big gut laugh. And we ended up sitting in his office talking for hours. And uh, he did more for me in those couple of hours than most people do in a lifetime. But the thing that he did the most for me, as I sat and looked at him, it was so evident of the presence of God in that room but it was all around the man. And for the first time in my life, I could see a man and I could feel God. And the man wasn't trying to be God. And they were friends. And I was just awestruck. And everything inside of me said, that's what I want. I want that relationship. And to get that relationship, you've got to get a healing inside yourself. You've got to get an identity inside yourself and not try and steal God's identity. But introduce him as your friend. Isn't it amazing when we get with people, we try to steal their identities, we become like them, wear the clothes they wear, do the things they have, and yet God's wanting us to be ourselves and to just do what we do. And he'll go with us and he will be that light that gives us the acceptance. And he is the one that will make a way for us. So you're in your father's house and I just want you just to relax for a bit. I'm not going to take all day, but I just think that God sent me here of a message this morning. And uh, it's a message to release some of you into the growth that God has predestined for this church body. For the positioning of this church body. And you've tried many different things, but there's no greater thing than just to be yourself. Amen. Our team are very effective what they do because I didn't try to clone each one of them. I let each one be their self. I did clean up around the banks, but never changed the course of the river. <laughs> Change the course of the river and you've got environmental damage. But you let the river flow where it needs to flow, but just... Let it flow with the integrity and morality that it needs to flow with. 
And the thing that God spoke to me about is forgiveness. I'm understanding forgiveness. That if you really want to be released, it's not enough to be forgiven. You must forgive. And there's a parable in the Bible where a man who owed much was about to have his family taken, everything was brought before the king and asked simply to for payment. And he pleaded with the king and said, I haven't got it, but I love my family. The king heard his cry and the purity of his heart in his cry and said, I'll release you totally. But the man went away, and as he went away, he came across somebody that owed him a little. And he demanded the repayment. And the man pleaded with him, but he had no mercy. And those that heard it went back and told the king, and the king brought him back and asked him. And then, because he had done that thing, he was put into the hand of the tormentors. When you find yourself in the hands of the tormentors, the greatest ministries in the world can't set you free the greatest intercessors can't set you free the bible says you will be there until you learn to forgive because much has been forgiven to you and you must forgive there was a young man in this area actually that taught me a lot about love in my early days and he saw his motorbikes. He was an intern that came with me and asked me to train him. And we were traveling. He'd come out on the road with me. I remember we was down around Ballon and we was going up around some mountains. And I said to him, I said, bro, how come you win races on a 125cc against 250s and 400cc motorbikes? And he said, because they've got too much power, Wayne. They don't know how to use the power they've got. Too much power will always make you lose. But to you learn to use the power that you got to the fullness. And I never forgot it. Anyway, one day he came to see me. and I was pastoring a church down. It was a church that was growing. It was the first church I ever pastored before. I actually moved up to Toowoomba out to Bellevue for 12 months or 18 months, actually, where I just locked myself away for 14 hours a day to do study before I took the church over in Orange. And he, I knew him here, and he was a friend. And, uh, but he had went through some trouble because he was in a marriage where his wife was in immortality. She was playing around on him. And he went through hell with it. Anyway, one day I was working in the church down in Brisbane, and uh, I looked up into the sanctuary, and there he was sitting in the middle of the sanctuary, and he, because uh, we never locked our sanctuary. And uh, I went up and said, what, you, what are you doing here, mate? He said, I just need a place of quiet and a place where I can contact God to come. And I said, what's wrong? And he just said, oh, it's the same thing, just problems. He started to tell me what it was, and it was, in my mind, horrific. And I said, is she still alive, mate? Is the bloke still alive? And he said, yeah, I, I never harmed him. Thank you, Jesus. Because if it had been me, they'd have been dead. You know? <laughs> no doubt about it, more than dead. I'd have tortured their dead body. <laughs> They'd have spun out. Seriously. It would have been just a mind breaker for me. And he told me, I said, what did you do? He said, I got up and cooked them breakfast. And he said, and I give him breakfast and said a prayer over him and come down here. And I said, listen, mate, you've got to divorce her. It's done. You've got to get out of there. God doesn't expect you to live in that type of a life. You just need to get out. And he turned to me with the most honest eyes and he looked at me and he said, but Pastor Wayne, you don't understand. I love her. And that something broke inside of my head that day. To have the love that passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. 
to have the love that passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And if you are out of alignment, one of the things that God gave me and the verse that God called me into ministry on and uh, that I started my ministry calling when uh, the prophets prophesied over me and set me out was from Isaiah 40. And they said, this is the chapter that's going to be the chapter of your life. It says, comfort, yes, comfort my people, say, says your God, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That's just part of it. You know that one of the things of our ministry is not to take people into spiritual warfare of fighting devils, but to get them to understand that the devils are, are defeated. They're not fighting to get victory ground. They're not fighting. They're fighting from victory ground. They're not worshiping from captured ground to get victory ground. They're worshiping from the spirit to minister in the spirit. They're not ministering from to be to get victory. We start to understand that Jesus defeated all principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. And you can't build your life, a business, a church. You can't build anything in a time of war. All your resources, all your energy will go to fight that war. That's why we call it the gospel of peace. It brings peace out of turmoil. But you can't bring peace unless you're established in peace. You can't make the right decisions until you have learned the peace. Jesus said upon the cross, my peace I give unto you. When the organic gospel is preached through a prophetic utterance, it clears the way from warfare and builds a highway for the people to follow. It removes out the obstacles. And it makes a straight path. That's the prophetic utterance. Powerful, isn't it? When you are there, Jesus was in a boat with some very seasoned fishermen. And in that boat, those fishermen who had been out in that lake many times got into a storm. But the storm got into them. They woke Jesus up who was sleeping in the boat. And they said, we're, we're dead. We're going to die. They had no authority over that storm, even though authority was given to them over the storm. Authority was given them to heal the sick. Authority was given to them to raise the dead. I'm sure they looked into that storm and tried to take authority over it, but authority was taken authority over them. The storm was in them. They had no authority over the storm when they were in them. As a boxer, I used to watch my opponent. And as you walked around the ring and as you started to move, there was a point in that fight where you saw the glimmer in his eye that you knew you owned him. You were inside of his head. You had every move, which way he went. And he started to see defeat. And that was the end of the fight. Once you're inside a person's head, you drive them. That's why God has to get inside of us to drive us. And that's why we have evangelism. But anyway, we're not going back there. But the key to it is, is you've got to get to that place and understand that place. Jesus, who was in the boat, asleep, came out and rebuked them because of their lack of faith. I think if I was one of his disciples, I'd have thrown him overboard at that point. I mean, he's the one that brought us there. I mean, I'd have flipped out, wouldn't you? That's not where you really need to be accused. Why don't you understand as we're trying? But then he spoke to the storm and it became still and they stood in amazement. What manner of man is this? He couldn't speak peace to the storm unless the peace was in him. The storm, he was in the storm. 
but not part of the storm. He was in the storm, but not part of the storm. A, fish, a ship in an ocean is okay. The ocean in a ship is all wrong. The church in the world or in the war is okay, but the war in the church will destroy it. Because that's where you know that you've got ambitions that are wrong and a false wisdom flowing through the place. It's not the wisdom of God. That wisdom is sensual, devilish, causes divisions and strife, causes people to burr up against one another rather than to lay down in green pastures. Peace. To bring peace, not by bringing a false illusion that there is no war, but the God of peace is in you. You are bigger than the enemy that's coming against you. If you see the enemy and you see yourself as grasshoppers, that's the way the enemy will see you. But you see as God as your strength and your deliverer. That's when the people will see God as your strength and your deliverer. When you're in adverse situations and it should take you down and you survive, your God is announcing your protection. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that when they were taken into Nebuchadnezzar's court. And then they were given all this food. And it was the best food. It was the food that the army of Nebuchadnezzar was fed on. The ones that he fed the royalty. The, one that, the reason why he plundered Jerusalem wasn't for the gold and silver, but it was for the young men. Because he needed leadership. And he brought that leadership there, and that was his prized possession. To raise them up. To build his kingdom. Because they had a renown for strategy. But they had to introduce them to the God that protected them. The same way God had to introduce himself to the Philistines that had taken the Ark of the Covenant and put it down with Dagon. You see, Israel was in sin. They brought the Ark of the Covenant rather than the God of the Covenant into the battle. You start to build on a gift and rather than the holiness of God and have God in your midst and you've got that gift, you're in trouble. They lost the presence. But the presence was still there. It was still in the Ark when it took it to the temple. Dagon fell over and the head fell off. The people started to get piles. They said, get this thing out of here. (laughs) Because God still had his power. But the people that was deserving his power had stepped aside from his power. They needed to get re-educated with the power, not the gift. Re-educated with the power, not the gift. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? And once we get to know that, once we get to understand that, and in this Isaiah 40, it's about really bringing peace, ministering peace, talking to the people, creating a path. They'll fight against you, but they won't prevail over you. You're there to announce God and bring God in, that God is in his temple. Jesus, when he went into the temple, he took a whip and he overturned the tables and he drove out those that had made commercial the church. They were selling the things that... They used for sacrifices and everything else. They weren't selling pornography or anything else. They were selling legitimate things, but they had taken the power of the church out by having commerce within the church. And he drove them out. And we read what the, 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 the result of that was. He then brought the people into the temple and healed them. There was healing again in the house of God. There was connection again at the altar because the altar had been defiled. The altar is our church building. We are the church. And we come to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God upon that altar. And that altar and what we offer on that altar is going to bring the dimensions of the power down. And if we can build a clean altar, God will answer by fire on that altar the same as he did for Elijah. 
And it'll be the fire of the Holy Ghost, not the fire of strange fire. And so we need to understand that. We need to see this. So I just want to give you an understanding that many times when you're working with an individual, a church, a business, a, a city, or a state, or a country, I work with leaders on various different areas. The problem is not in how much money you got. The problem isn't in how big your army is or how big your church is. I just introduce you to our team, and when people meet that team and what they do, they just can't believe it. They think you've got thousands out on the street. Hezekiah was a young king, found in 2 Kings 18. And when he was anointed king, he tore down the high places. And then he broke in pieces the rod that Moses had made, that the people looked under it, that gave their healing, because they worshipped it. And he smashed it before the people. He knew that he didn't need a bigger army, he didn't need better money. He didn't even need more wisdom. He just needed the God of Israel to be with him. He needed God to be his backbone, his backstop. But this brought about, as he brought the knowledge of God back in, and as we have to do that, the greatest siege in the world happened on his kingdom. So much so that the men that were, had his city under siege were so bold, they were coming up and telling him, why are you in that place? Why don't you come down? We'll give you lands. We'll give you this. You can come. We'll, we'll bless you. Come on out. Leave this loser. And Hezekiah had his sackcloth on under his clothes and he was walking around the wall and he heard two women arguing on whose baby they were going to eat that day. And it grieved his heart and he went back to God and the runners had brought in another note of surrender in terms of surrender and he read it. And he went down into the temple and something happened with inside of him because he realized his deliverance was outside of him. Even though he held the position, it still had to be he couldn't remove all the high places and the places of worship and then be worshipped himself. He had to introduce the people to God. God had to be the head of the house. And to do that, he had to surrender his leadership. Isn't it amazing when we've got a control spirit, it's hard to surrender our leadership, and yet we think we're protecting the people we're controlling? We're helicopter parents hovering right over the top of them. I'm going to know it's for your good. We, we don't let them make a mistake. And yet we know it provoked us to rebellion. It's going to provoke them to rebellion. <laughs> yeah, we do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, like we do on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Dare not to be different. Dare not to step out. Bring the God of creation in. At this particular point, he got the note that was sent to him and he put it on the altar and he said, read that, God. That's what they're saying about you and your people. The moment he gave it to God, God said, this day I will deliver you. Before 24 hours is up, you'll be delivered. And God took four lepers that was at the front gate and delivered them. It's a great story. When you bring the God that is God back. That's why David wanted so much the glory taken back and established in Jerusalem. When God's God of the house, prosperity, peace, reconciliation, healing flows. It's a river that runs out onto the people. And we're all here and we're all human. So as we get into this, and that started to affect my ministry, and I'm going to cut it short because I'm running out of time. And the reality is this. I was up in Alaska doing a revival. God was moving very powerfully. 
We've seen God move very powerfully from our church and out of our church and uh, the group that we're in. And uh, I was in a place called Anchorage. No, I wasn't. I, I was in... Um, I think a bit in a second. It's the capital of uh, Jerome or uh, in there. Anyway, when I was there, I was in the Assemblies of God Church. And we were meeting in the gym because the church couldn't get registered. Beautiful facility. But every time they went to fix it, something went wrong with it. And the council knocked this or that, and something happened. Just, it was like they were just running into this brick wall every time they wanted to move. And they asked me to come up and break it open. And uh, so I went up there and I preached the first message. And as I was preaching, I was moving around and God started to show me that there was a crack running right through the foundation of the church. And as I was preaching, I was looking at the pastor and I was trying to follow what God was saying to me. And, and the Lord was speaking to me. He says, as soon as they build, they crumble. They can't get past a certain place because the foundation has a flaw in it. They robbed my servant and he gave me an amount of money. So after the meeting, I said to the pastor, I said, you know, I can't do a week here. I said, there's no use me trying to build in this place. It's just going to crumble. I'll be wasting my time and your time. And if I do a revival here and nothing happens, that's going to put a, a mark against us rather than for us. Cause people to doubt the authenticity of the ministry. And so as I was ministering and as I was flowing, with him, I said, this is what God told me. He told me that there's a, a crack in the foundation of your main building. And he said, the reason that you're having problems is your eldership robbed the pastor of a certain amount of money. And he said, Wayne, I know nothing about it. But one of the elders was sitting in the room, and I could see he did, just by his body language. I said, well, why don't you tell us about it? He said, it's nothing. I said, well, God thinks it's something. He said, it was years ago. I said, I couldn't care if it was yesterday. I couldn't care if it was 50 years ago. There's no time with God. I said, what happened? He said, well, that we're building the church and everything, and the pastor's there, and we're having growth, and, and uh, he got into immorality. And so we, we, we fired him. But he had lent the church this amount of money in the building because we were short. And we didn't feel obligated to pay it back because of what he was in. I said, so two wrongs make a right, huh? Isn't that the trap we always fall in when we feel justified not to forgive and not to restore? When God has so often forgiven us and restored us? That it's only the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. I found out the pastor died in a plane crash. He was a bush pilot. It's a very dangerous job up there. But his children were still there. His wife was still there. They weren't going to church anywhere. And I just asked the Lord, I just said, Lord, what do we do? And the Lord spoke to me, he said, bring fruit of repentance. So I said to the pastor, I said, I really believe for this church to go ahead and be healed that it needs to pay back the pastor. But he's dead. I don't care if he's dead. It's still a debt. His death didn't demolish it. His family still live under the curse of what happened here. They were punished. The innocent was punished for something that someone else did wrong. His children are not going on with God. His wife isn't going to church. We haven't got that type of money. We're just getting through. And I said, well, there's no use me preaching unless you're willing to pay back that money. And then the elder said, well, if we had it, we would pay it back. I'm not, I said, I'm not asking you whether you had it. I'm asking you whether you are willing to acknowledge it and pay it back. And they thought about it. And by this time, there were several elders in the room and the pastor. And they said, yeah, we could do that. We'll do that. We'll make that pledge. We'll do that. 
we'll give them back the money. I said, no, you'll give them back the money with interest. That was their money. You stole it. I don't care how you dice it, slice it or cut it, you stole it. No matter how justified you are in your own mind. And so they agreed. It was as hard as anything to move it. When a stronghold is there and something is there that's tainting the flow of love and tainting the flow of purity. Satan is very clever when he sets a trap and we fall into the mud. It holds us. It doesn't have to have bars or walls. It's invisible, but it holds us there. Unforgiveness is a terrible thing that holds us in a place of non-progression. So I did the next meeting and I explained to the church that some things had happened and uh, what we wanted to do was just to clear up any misunderstandings and we just wanted to just clear up the ground so we could go forward. I took up an offering. I said, we can fix this today. And every cent came in with interest. And the pastors were amazed that they looked at it. And you could see that some of them was really resenting giving the interest. And they said, well, we'll send her a check. I said, no, you bring her down to this church, this next meeting. And before the church, you'll apologize. And you'll give her this money. Well, half the town turned up when they heard about it. They just turned up to see the spectacle. But in the spirit that it was done, people were running down the front. Within 10 seconds of me starting my message to get saved. And that church broke open. Got a beautiful church there today. One act, self-justified but poisoning, can kill you, can separate you from the place where God wants you if you haven't got the power of forgiveness, the power of restoration, to be the bigger party, party, to lose a round to win the fight, to not make the person look bad, but just to be able to carry him. I remember I, I had to fight one of my friends and we were fighting and I knew I could have him in about the fourth round, but I carried him through the next rounds because I didn't want to make a fool of him. I didn't want to see him go down before the people because he had love there, he had respect. When you go into a church, when I go into a church, most of the time I'm working on about 25% maximum of my anointing. Only very rarely do you get to really let the whole thing go. It's like driving a Corvette. If you let it go every time you got into it, you're not going to have it for long. You're going to have tickets longer than witches' dreams. You go in to just encourage the people and draw them along, not blow them out of the water. Not get them into a fast running brook. Not make them feel idiots. But to show them that God is graceful. But he's also authoritative. He's also powerful. And I'm just going to close with this. With me having dyslexia. I had some tremendous miracles. I had a miracle where God saved me from doing natural life imprisonment. And opened the doors. It was a miracle, absolute miracle. I pled guilty, not, not innocent, and still never did any jail time. That God was able to go on my behalf through a clause that was in the law at that time, I think it still is, that if a person could be proven to be more beneficial outside of the penal system, they could be released on a special bonding. It hadn't been used for a hundred, a hundred years, you know. It hadn't been used since the convict days, and that's why they had it in there, because they had to get their police out of the convicts, and they looked for ones that could police the other ones and appoint policemen and things like that. And a QC went there and uh, got that for me. But I had the, still the biggest prison of my life. 
Every one of us have a dumping spot in our life. When we dump everything on, mine was my dad. Because that's what people represented him as. I couldn't see one good thing my dad had done. Yet other people thought he was a hero. Other people made songs about him. But I saw him as a drunk and an abusive man. I saw him hit my mom. I saw what he did. I was, the, I was the product of his infidelity. I was the child of the woman next door and my brother. Living in a house now that with half-brothers and half-sisters with his original wife, thinking our mum was dead. When my mum came back onto the scene and they got back together again and there would be fights and arguments and drunkenness. I couldn't ever see the man that people saw. Somewhere in life he went in another turn. I guess I was part of that mistake. I remember one night he was coming home, he'd give my mum a hide in the morning. I stood in the kitchen and the back door was in line with it and as he opened the back door I shot the earlobe off his ear with a 222 rifle. And I said, the moment my mama dies, I'm going to visit hell on you. I said, you die, I'll give you, f I'll give you transfusions and bring you back just to make you feel the pain that you brought this family through. And yet he was a man. He just looked at me. Didn't say too much at all. Just wiped away his ear. Went down, sat at the table, poured out a beer and had a smoke. That's the gospel truth. Not too much was said about it at all. A psychologist told me that if I'd born to a different family, I could have been anything that I wanted. If I would have had different parents, brought up in a different understanding, that made me hate him even more because it wasn't my mum. She was a saint. So I thought. And I tried to forgive my dad when I got saved. I'd walk up and down under the mango trees and the mulberry tree that were there. And I'd be walking. It was up here in Toowoomba, actually, in Valeview. I'd say, Lord, help me forgive him. And I'd think I had forgiven him. I'd think I had forgiven him until someone mentioned his name and said something good about him. Brrr, and up it came again, just straight out like a dog getting through the door, you know. <laughs> just where did that dog come from? And I went to a place, invited my ministries, and I was down to a place called Scarborough near Redcliffe. It was on the water or near the water, an old Methodist place, and they were doing a leadership conference there, and the pastor they had there was talking on tabernacles and tabernacling with God. And I was dyslexic. I didn't have an education. I didn't know how to read or write. I wasn't an idiot by any means, but I just didn't know how to read or write, and I, I was smart enough to conceal it pretty well by getting people to do jobs for me, learning by word identification. <laughs> but I tried. It wasn't for the sake of trying. I tried awfully hard. I put more effort into it than most. And he was asking people about tabernacles. Can you explain to me the tabernacle of David? And I'm sitting there thinking, listen, trying to listen to what, what is a tabernacle? It could have been a Holden car. It could have been anything. I had no idea what a tabernacle was. You know, when people think they're communicating and they're just... You're sitting there looking like, you know, a deer caught in the headlights of a car, you know. Do I run? Do I stay? Bang. Tabernacle of Moses. And I had this finger not in my gut that he was going to ask me. So I got up and excused myself and I went to the beach and I'm walking along the beach. And I had tears coming out of my eyes. They weren't tears, of, they were anger, they was pure hatred. And I just thought to myself, I should have killed him when I had the chance. 
I should just put a bullet in his head. Everyone would have been the better for it. And I sat down on a pipe that went out and overlooked into the bay there. It was a storm water pipe just on the water. It was late at night. And as I sat there, two hands appeared out of the darkness. Now, you'd think that would put you in a mental asylum. But that was the peace. That's the peace that I tell our people when they go on the street. If they carry that peace, no matter what hostility they walk into, that peace will quieten it down. It'll make an angry person calm. It'll cause a softening. It's the oil. And as these two hands just appeared and started to wipe the tears out of my eyes, I felt a warmth go through my whole body. And I had a voice speak out authoritatively and said, you must forgive your father. And as soon as he said that, a voice spoke out of me that was outside of my control. I didn't think about it. It just came out of my mouth. Oh, never forgive him. And it scared me because I didn't give my mouth permission to speak. If you're saying things that your mind didn't give permission to think, you know that there's some things in there you need to get rid of. If you've got some things that you say and then walk away and think, I shouldn't have said them, I wish I was a vacuum cleaner, suck those ones back up, and hide them back in there, you know. <laughs> if you've ever done that, then there's a few adjustments that need to be made up top. And uh, but <laughs> this, this doesn't speak. You know what David said? Let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, O God. Let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable. Then I won't be guilty of the great transgression. <laughs> and I scared myself when I said it. And again, he said, you must forgive your father. You must forgive your father. And I just dropped my head. I just felt hopeless. And I said, Lord, you know I've tried to forgive him. He said, son, if you'll forgive him, I'll restore to you the years the locust, the canker worm, the farmer worm, and the caterpillar has taken from your life. I'll cause you to walk upon the high places of my kingdom, among the princes and the princesses of my kingdom. And I'll give you a place of settled and quiet. I had no idea that that type of thing was in the Bible. But I was at peace. I just said, Lord, I can't. I've tried. And then he, a pause came, and he said, anything that you could have been yesterday, you can be tomorrow. You're not dead. And I thought about it, and it again spoke. He said, son, your father loved you in the only way he knew how. He couldn't give you what he never had. He didn't run. I had never seen my father as a victim. I had never seen my father as a victim. I always saw us as the victim and he as the oppressor. No one had ever told me or spoke to me on behalf of my father. No crier went out. Same as when they hung Jesus on the cross. No crier went out. The crier didn't go through the streets. Does anyone know anything good about Jesus of Nazareth? Let him come and declare it. No one came and declared it because the crier didn't go out. There was no crier that, that stood and was the defense attorney for my dad. There was a defense attorney for the first time with a woman caught in adultery. And that was Jesus who actually turned the whole situation back on the accusers. And, and brought forth a woman so loyal, so committed. She washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. What an example forgiveness can bring. And what a changed life we can release people in when we tell people they're forgiven. And they believe it. That you're not playing with their emotions. You're not storing it up for another day that you can actually forgive them. 
and release the power of forgiveness into their lives. For the first time, I saw my dad in a different light. I saw myself not as the son he needed me to be. For the first time, I saw myself as guilty, that he was wounded, and I didn't see his wounds. I wanted a bruised and broken, wounded man to heal me when he needed his son to heal him. And I got in that car and I drove the other side of the town. It was a fair way away and I got in. It was early in the morning. I went up and there was my dad looking out into the darkness, looking through the window, smoking one hand and a beer in the other. As soon as he saw me, he said, what do you want? I said, Dad, it's not going to work this time. He said, what won't work? I said, I'm not here to fight you. I'm not here to argue with you. Why are you here? I said, I've come to ask you for forgiveness. What for? I said, for not being the son you needed me to be. I don't know what happened in your life that caused you to go the way that you went. But I'm asking your forgiveness for not seeing it and being what you need me to be to help you. I said, Dad, I want to make a promise with you. I promise you that the day won't go by that I won't try to be that son. That I won't be the son that you need me to be. To be able to bring you through to that place. And it wouldn't be long before I actually saw my dad in church worshipping the Lord, tears rolling down his face. Through the power of forgiveness. And the dyslexia, I never really beat it. It hangs around. But God put people in my life that directed me around it. Ari Anderson, whose father was shot by a gangster, saw me preaching and asked, could he mentor me? And mentored me through to my first doctorate. Teaching me, finding ways to get the education into my life. Understanding, getting me to listen to the Holy Spirit. Mentoring. We started to excel, move forward. I've never seen a person that has ever got the baggage out of their life not move forward. David said this, he said, I've been young and now I'm old, but yet have I seen the seed of the uncompromisingly righteous begging food. I tell you, God is a good, good father and he disciplines those whom he receives. He doesn't punish, but he disciplines and we learn that correction isn't rejection. And we learn to go to him and realize that if he's disciplining us, he's preparing us for promotion. Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage you. I'm going to give a chance in a minute. I'm going to pray a general prayer of release from unforgiveness. And for you to get a glimpse in your life that you can restore the vibrance in your marriage, your family your workplace, you can create a different ambience where you're working or where you're living and what you're doing by moving under a mantle of peace and under the gospel of peace that becomes contagious and that you can flow in dimensions of God that will be perpetually going in your life. But before I do, Pastor Jimmy, I have a word for you. Can, I, can you come out? And usually I don't do this. I'm very reluctant to do it in churches. Or even speaking to pastors unless God does speak to me. But last night, Jimmy, the Lord came to me and spoke to me. And he gave me a dream through the night. And in the dream, I saw a man, I know it represented you. And you had come to the aid of several different people. And you were like a David coming to the aid of Saul and to the aid of Israel. And you took tremendous burden upon yourself and you gave everything that you had from inside of you. And these people opened up a door of acceptance. And they opened up a seat that they wanted to sit in. There was a seat of preeminence. But yet when you sat in the seat secretly, 
and they were threatened by you. Secretly, they cornered you. And secretly, they came against you because you dulled their light. And you're going to have to use the wisdom of David to walk the path that God has given you and that he's called you to. And learn to navigate that path with wisdom. Know who your friends are and who your friends are not. And then I saw that because of what was happening, because of what was taking place in your life, a vision started to come into you and it was calling you to this place and to that place and the world seemed so big and yet the very place you came to rescue and the very place you stepped in started to become a prison to you and a, something that was a confinement to where you had to go and what you had to do and you were torn. And because of the tearing, the place was starting to lose some direction and it was like one of the tie rod ends come off the engine, off the steering. And the car just started to wander here and there a little bit. You had control of it and you brought it back. And you were able to stop it and to ponder it and to think about it. And God wants to use you in a way and you're going to have to learn to walk within that way. And this is not a place of confinement. This is a launching pad. And you will raise up leaders in this place as you give yourself. And it will come forth. And it will do, but use wisdom. This is a time where the anointing is upon you and the word of God has come to you that you will do this and you will do that. And even though many have accepted it and many have seen it and voiced approval but inwardly their hearts have been threatened and you're going to need the wisdom of God to navigate it in a very real way and just be still as you were before you were appointed to know that if God's for you then God will build you have the patience you had in the beginning in the end do not be baited into a war that you never had to fight because the Lord God was lifting you up and the Lord God was developing you. Did that mean anything? Did that speak anything to you? Because you're anointed. And Father, I just thank you for his wisdom. I thank you for the size of the fight you've put in this one. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the fight in the dog. And there's plenty of fight in this one as he goes forward to just do what you've called him to do, that you would draw people to him and that you would draw people into that place that they would become stronger than him as David, some of David's men become stronger than him. But David knew how to develop leadership. Give him the wisdom of how to develop leadership that other leaders will feel content to come out of their houses of straw and their houses of wood and find security in the house of stone. Lord, that they would find it more liberating to come and join than to compete. That they would find it more liberating to join and become an army of one that would move forward in power and strength. Father, let that ambience go before him and let that integrity, let that stability, and let that wisdom go deeper and deeper and deeper. And Lord, as he ponders you, may he get more away from the sense knowledge that comes through sight, hearing, smell, taste, and feel, and depend more on revelation knowledge that bubbles up out of his spirit and is revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. And he becomes a student of the Holy Ghost and learns the mystery of the gospel and the power of the gospel and the magnitude to put this city under siege of peace. 
and that every divisionary spirit, every spirit of war will just leave. In Jesus' name, as peace and light start to flow through the city, darkness flees into the nooks and the crannies to hide from the light. Let that light start to come and let us not to shine bright from this house in Jesus' name. And give him the wisdom of David, Lord, as he goes forth into battle to always be there that the God of the battle goes before him and that the victory is a complete victory and the love that David had for his soldiers and his kingdom, that he never once used his sword against them but always used it to defend them. Let that heart continue to be in him in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Bless you, Pastor Jimmy. It's an honor being your friend. For those of you that have been caught in some type of unforgiveness, it's the easiest thing to do is to rip up the IOU, to let it go, to not search after it. To me, when I was chasing salvation, everything that I had, my money, which is quite a lot, I surrendered. When I became a Christian, I kept nothing, not even the rings off my wife's fingers. And we started again. If, the God could, if, God could, if the devil could bring me to where I was, then God could take me further. To trust God. All you need is God. You don't need the gold and silver of Egypt. You need the God of creation. You need the God of creation. And as you just release, I know there's people that come through. I know that I took over a church where people had been brutalized and dogs had come in and savaged them and they were two-legged ones, all in the name of love. But until I lifted that church above that and got them into love, and got them into freedom where they could walk with one another and not see cultures, but realize he brought them out of every kindred and tongue, people and nation, and made them one. I've got more streams of humanity flowing through my uh, past life. Talk about a mongrel. Man, I'd hate to get a DNA test done, find out where I come from. But when I read that scripture, he brought us out of every kindred and tongue, people and nation. I sat down and I said, listen, guys, I don't care where you all come from to get to here to make me. You're all coming into unity. We can't be one perfect uh, Jew or one perfect Gentile. We can't even be a, 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 a purebred mongrel. I said, but we can be a purebred Christian. Let's all jump in that boat together. I'm thanking God that he engrafted me out of one tree and into another tree. The tree that I grew up in, my family tree, had too many nuts, too many squirrels in it. I needed to get engrafted into another one. And I want to tell you today that many times, just like you and just like me, the people we've hurt, we haven't had recollection of hurting them. It's the hurt that was perpetual within our lives. But if we can understand the forgiveness that God gave us. I just share this one thing with you. I was in New Zealand preaching. I was a full gospel businessman. And just after I'd gotten saved a few years after, and a guy came in with a newspaper and he said, is this you? I said, I guess. He said, what right have you got to come in here and teach us how to live? Speak about the goodness of God. You deserve to die. I don't care what this, you deserve to die. And he made a lot of sense. There was an old Maori minister there called Bill Wilson. Bill came over to defend me, but that didn't do much good. I, I, I thanked him. But that guy got into my head like that storm got in the disciples' head. I came home and I was in Australia and I was still doing what I used to do, but I just lost the zeal. I had questionings in my head. I'd sit there and say, well, did you really forgive me? Or is this just a hoax? Were I really forgiven? 
did you really set me free? And I started to go into depression. And there was a prophet in town who had spoken, I'd been to, and uh, he wasn't a friend, but I knew him and he barely knew me. A bit like a groupie. They know the band, but the band doesn't know them. You know? And that's about where it was. And I went along to hear him, and I was sitting in a room about twice the size, pretty packed, sitting somewhere in the middle. And he was talking on the prodigal son. And as he talked on the prodigal son, I felt myself saying, I wished it was true. I just wished it was true. I, I thought it was true, but I wished it was true. And as he was, he moved up and down the aisles. He was very charismatic and had a tremendous method of communication. And he was talking about how the father took the son's hand and put a ring on his hand and forgave him. And as I was looking at him, he was right at the end of the line where I was sitting in. And I saw a ring on his finger. And I just thought in my mind, I said, Lord, if truly you've forgiven me, truly then I've been released. The day that you put a ring on my finger just like that one, and I know it's you, I'll never question my salvation again. I'll never question the authenticity of your love. And he went on preaching and he went up to the pulpit and he stood behind the pulpit and he preached for a few minutes and he just stood there looking out over the congregation and then walked right down, walked right up in the line while I was sitting back there where my team was. He looked me in the eye, pulled the ring off his finger and he says, Jesus told me to just come and put this on your finger. Ah, snot tears, the whole lot coming out. I was a wreck all over the floor. They had to carry me out of that place. It's moments like that, that if you keep pressing in and be authentic, heaven will open up. He's the author and finisher of your faith. He's the one that bring people into your life and give you acceptance that other people can't get. I remember a guy took me to introduce me to a person. He was a major ministry and said, Wayne, when you get there, this is how you act and everything. I said, okay. And when we got in there, as we walked in, he went to introduce me and the guy saw me and said, oh, Wayne, how you doing? I haven't talked to you for a while. This guy, he ran over and gave me a hug. He said, mate, we'll have to get together. Come by my office, I've got a check for you. God will give you favor with people. You don't have to name drop. You don't have to do anything. It's got to be you. He'll make a way for you. That's why you can keep friends like that. Amen? So, Father, we thank you as we come before you. And I want you just to follow me in a little prayer. It's not too complicated because God's not complicated mightn't sound much just like that prayer that brings a seed or releases a seed of salvation in someone's life. It's only a few words, but it'll hold, change your whole destiny. And so will forgiveness. Just say this prayer after me. If you feel that God's got there, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Lord Jesus, you have forgiven me of much. You've been gracious towards me. I deserve punishment as I have sinned in thought and deed. And I came to you and you forgave me. Lord, through that same forgiveness that you bestowed upon me, I bestow on those that have used me and abused me and stole from me or offended and hurt me. And just as you released me, Jesus, I release them today that I can grow that I can become your disciple, that you can restore the years the locust, the canker worm, the palm worm, and the caterpillar has taken out of my life, that you can put me back together again, that I can love. 
and be loved and be healed. Now, Lord, I thank you that I release it to you. Amen. Now I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for your anointing that goes where man's hands can't go, where scalpels can't operate, where antibiotics and penicillin can't work. But your anointing is there to penetrate and heal the brokenhearted and set at liberty them that are bruised. That even now, thank you, that even now, Lord Jesus, right now, you go deep within the spirit of man. Bring healing, bring restoration. And I command the soul to give up its hurts in Jesus' name. That healing would flow. Restoration would take place. That lives would be reconciled. That the spirit of this age of renewal, the Holy Spirit under the power of the prophetic move where sons are brought back to the fathers and fathers back to the sons, daughters to mothers and mothers back to the daughters. Families are restored and healed. And the harshness of yesterday is gone. And the commitment of love remains. That we can, Lord, be gentle with each other, forgiving and kind. In Jesus' name, Lord, let it happen. Let them follow it home. Lord, let it over this next week and the week after just permeate to heal and soften. Let the oil come deep within and soften every heart. Let that oil just break up that hardness and take the heart of stone and give that heart of flesh. Amen and amen. Now, I believe there's someone here that Pastor Jimmy was saying that they need prayer for their boy. I'll hand back to him and I'll work with him as he wants to pray for people for sickness. Hallelujah. Just want to honor the Lord for this man of God and... For those of you who might want to go, um, I'm going to pray and release you to go, but we're going to open the altar here in a minute. And uh, those who are sick in their bodies, I want to encourage you to come out. We will pray for you. We'll lay hands on you. Uh, Dr. Wayne uh, has a tremendous uh, healing anointing on his life. And we're going to believe God for healing for you. Uh, take advantage while he's here with us and uh and let's believe god for that so let's stand up on our feet and um those who are sick i see darius here with us good to see you mate uh all the way from brisbane uh they've driven up just to be here this morning and i know that he needs healing so we're gonna pray for you in a minute but anybody else that needs a healing touch from god the altar is going to be open right here and uh, we're going to trust the Lord for healing. Now, if you would like to bless and stand with Ignite Australia, this is uh, Dr. Wayne's ministry and the team that he comes with and travels with. They have a tent that they take around uh, the nation, a 10,000-seater tent, which actually belong to Oral Roberts. And uh, they've been taking it around the nation, preaching the gospel. It costs a lot of money. And if you would like to sow and to stand with them as they get going again with tent ministry, uh, Pat's right at the back through that door. Uh, there's an f post machine there. Just let Pat know that this is for Ignite Australia. And we want to be a blessing to them and stand with, stand with them. So those of you who may need a healing, come to the front. The rest of you, Father, I just pray a blessing over your people right now. Lord, as we leave this place, as we uh, leave this, uh, 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 this service, Lord, we thank you for the seeds of the word that has been sowed into our spirit and into our hearts. And Father, I pray for your people that, Lord, you will bless them, bless their going out and their coming in. I pray, Lord Jesus, this week that your protection is going to be upon them the lord you cover we cover their vehicles their transportation with the blood of jesus i thank you lord that no evil thing shall come nigh their dwelling place that each and every single person here is protected and covered from every kind of infirmity every kind of sickness and disease covid will never be their portion in the name of jesus and i thank you father god that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the lord forever and ever and ever amen god